everyone and welcome to our next segment of Moments with Mumilak. I am super excited for today's guest. The purpose of these segments, the purpose of these conversations is to share Indigenous perspectives, experiences, and thoughts. These perspectives are not my own. I'm looking to create awareness and support discussion among Indigenous peoples ourselves and Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples outside of these segments. Our guest today, her name is Donna Kimilatjuk. And uh, Donna, I'm so, so excited to talk to you today. And if just to kick us off, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Um, sure. So uh, I'm Donna Kimalarjik, as you stated. Uh, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and uh, I guess kind of what some people have recognized me as or associated with me uh, associated me with is I am the first Inuk uh, heart surgeon in in the country um, potentially in the world uh, and so that's kind of gained some media attention over the last couple of years uh, but I just recently moved to Cleveland Ohio so I'm speaking with you from the USA uh, so I could continue my training uh, here at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and then from there, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I have so many questions about that, but maybe just to take a couple of steps back and start a little bit more from the beginning. You had mentioned you grew up in Ottawa and growing up, were, was there anything, uh, when do you start remembering the time where you were you thought that oh uh, the medical profession is something that I want to get into when do you remember that interest kind of sparking and was there anything in particular that helped spark it definitely so um, I think I was around six years old or maybe almost seven years old and really what sparked my desire or my my what feels like my calling to be in medicine was uh, from a conversation that I had with my father. And um, I was an inquisitive kid and I was asking him why I didn't know his father because I knew all my other grandparents and I was very close with um, my maternal grandmother. Uh, and so he explained to me very honestly um, and directly, you know, that his father had died of a disease called ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or known as Lou Gehrig's disease um, and he explained to me even at the age of six that it's a disease that there's no cure for and it's a neurological disease and I remember him explaining it that it's you know it starts to eat away slowly the nerves in your body so you can no longer walk and then you can no longer like you know use your hands and feed yourself and then you know you're in a wheelchair but the whole time your brain is working normally you understand everything but you, you lose ability to do everything and eventually you die and that just struck a chord with me and I felt okay I want to become a doctor so I can help other people like this and so other kids don't have to lose their mom or their dad to this disease and then I thought you know okay I'll become a neurosurgeon so I can invent a surgery to like cure this disease um, and that was the passion or the, the 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 spark that lit the flame that carried me all through elementary high school and university up until I got into medical school that's great I love it I had so uh, there are so many times where I think to myself oh in another life I would be this or that and here I am uh, as an MP as a politician something I would have laughed in your face if you asked me a year ago if if this is where I'd be but I always thought that the the brain, especially uh, the science behind it, is something that is so fascinating in, for so many different reasons. And I think one of those reasons is actually because we still have yet so much to learn about it. Exactly. And I think that when, when, even when you look at the human body, there are so many complexities, but so many beautiful things that help create us who we are, help, you know, help us uh, think uh, on, a, on a different level of uh, awareness, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. I went off into my, oh, in another life, I would have been doing this <laughs> and that. Um, but uh, with that being said, was there at any point, uh, I guess, in time where other things may have felt a little bit more appealing or or was it after high school where you just decided to jump right in and and start working towards becoming a surgeon 
Um, honestly, like it was the goal from once I made my mind up at age six or seven. The only thing I thought beforehand was um, that I was going to be a concert pianist because piano was my first love. And like at that age, I was playing piano all the time and absolutely loved it. But um, yeah, I just, I felt this, this calling and um, as crazy as it may be, like I literally worked towards that goal from that age onward. Like, you know, getting good grades in school was a top priority for me because I knew I had to get good grades so I could get into university and then get into medical school. Um, and so that was just my driving force, like my whole life. I love it. That's amazing. And I have, I can't talk to any kind of experiences being an Indigenous person and being an Inuk in particular growing up in the South. Uh, is there anything that you think people make assumptions or, or stereotypes or have these uh, ideas that um, whatever they they may be that uh, you're you know well why aren't you in the north and you know I, I really have not much experience there is there anything that uh, you experienced growing up that uh, I'm not sure if barrier is the right word but uh, those assumptions and those stereotypes you know as a kid like you know in elementary and high school I really feel so fortunate that I don't think I experienced, you know, forms of racism like that or kind of those barriers or expectations. And I really, um, when I think about, well, why is that? Because I grew up in a white neighborhood in um, like in a French suburb of Ottawa. Uh, like my brother and I were the only indigenous kids in our school. There were not many students of color in our schools. Um, and so I think, well, wh wh how is that? Why is that? And I think it really came to do with when I was in elementary school, um, I think my teachers were just so accepting or excited to share our culture and our story that um, every year we'd have my mom and my grandmother come in and talk to like the whole school about Inuit culture and my grandma would bake bannock and give it to people and I think one year she brought in maktak and like you know little kamiks and all these pictures and talking about our culture and so it like normalized it for other kids. Like, I think if, you know, kids hear about other cultures like, you know, Inuit culture or other First Nations cultures or Métis or other indigenous cultures, like they're gonna understand, okay, that it's all right, that it's different and maybe get rid of those assumptions or uh, stereotypes that they might have. Um, and so I really attribute to just having amazingly supportive teachers and schools and environments where we celebrated our culture and people knew about my culture and it was like oh that's cool um the other thing too is like I was a pretty outgoing kid and um I think too and like very I think fairly confident and high self-esteem and uh, you know a bit of teacher's pet at times and so kids knew I was a smart kid and you know, maybe they weren't going to give me a hard time about other stuff because I was teacher's pet and the smart one. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was just very fortunate to have a very supportive upbringing. And, um, you know, in university, you kind of then meet more people from other backgrounds and realize a lot of people are ignorant um, and or racist. Um, I didn't experience anything too, too bad, at least not that I, you know, nothing to my face in university, but definitely you see that stigma around um, indigenous kids or like the difficulty around self-identifying um, and, you know, a lot of the stereotypes that people might have about uh, indigenous Canadians, you hear that yourself, like, oh, okay. So that sucked, but um, I, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I've been so focused on my end goal, which really my life has, sad or not revolved around becoming a surgeon um and so you kind of let that noise just be background noise and not let it bring you down or dictate what you're going to do with your life or who you're going to be as a person absolutely inuit deserve the right to determine themselves ourselves what we well, what our dreams are and being exactly. able to achieve them uh, it's really really great and and that's exactly I think something that not a lot of people can uh, grasp and a lot of time when we do talk about stereotypes assumptions racism discrimination really what we're talking about is a lack of awareness 
we're talking 100%. about lack of knowledge so it's it's really great to hear that that um in school you were able to share culture to be able to be accepted as as who you are mm -hmm. from high school from from graduating high school and going into university can you walk us through what that looked like and and the kinds of uh, homework hours you had and and the kinds of things that uh, kinds of courses you had to take and can you walk us a little bit through from high school until us sitting here today sure um, um i'm feeling old now trying to remember back to high school and that's a while and <laughs> um but I mean, um, high school, like I, it was kind of maybe fortuitous that I really loved the sciences uh, and I actually kind of liked math as well. Um, and so those were kind of really good courses to have as prerequisites for thinking of going into a science type degree in university. And so, um, you know, I, I went to uni um, high school in Ontario, so you take pretty standard courses in their first couple of years of high school and then I really tailored my studies to just a lot of science and math courses um, and uh, you know homework like just was like okay this is something I need to do in order to get good grades so I can get to university and I can get to med school like I don't know like I, I didn't make such a big fuss out of it I just knew okay this is something I have to do um, and you know, I, I didn't go to any private school. I didn't go to, um, uh, what are those schools called? I think like the International Baccalaureate School. I, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, IB schools or like, or you know, advanced practice courses. Like I just went to a publicly funded high school. Um, and so maybe too, I wasn't challenged as much as I could have been. So even if we had a lot of homework, it wasn't that difficult for me to get through it, but it was something that I did consistently every day. Like you just, you, you have to do it. Um, and so I knew I wanted to get really good grades to get it accepted into good universities. And I knew I wanted to go away for university. I wanted to leave home. Um, I mean, I love my parents very, very much, but I mean, they got divorced right when I graduated high school. So you can imagine it probably wasn't you know the happiest of homes that I would want to stay in uh, at that time so I was keen to be able to get into a good school in another city and so um, I made sure I had really good grades that I'd be a good candidate and at that time um, we didn't have a lot of um, you know extra money around uh, and so I actually had to pay for my own application to university I remember that because uh, it was $105 at the time and that got me an application that would uh, be able to be used for three schools. So I only applied to three schools because it was $105 uh, and that's money I'd made with my part-time job um, and uh, I, I was very fortunate to get into all three and the one that I wanted to go to was Queens because uh, they you know were closest to home. Uh, it felt like a really good like sense of community there and their programming seemed very appealing and so I picked something that was called life sciences which is kind of like a pre-med program there's no I don't think there's really such thing as pre-med in Canada um, but you can have undergraduate degrees that uh, kind of prepare you for med school or research in in the health sciences and so um, I went to university and you know the first year it's biology chemistry physics calculus and a social science course um, so there i think it was just managing learning how to manage yourself so yes i was very kind of self-directed in taking care of my homework and making sure i was organized in high school but now you know you have the fun of being away from home and maybe you're, you're around people who like to party or you know there's boys and so uh it was definitely a challenge that first year like just adjusting to being a young adult and really ensuring that you stay responsible. And I remember like all throughout university, there'd be some nights where my friends and I would be all night at the library, like studying all night or studying until 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Like it was a common thing, uh, especially around exam time. But again, it was like, this is something I need to do because I need, I, I felt like I, I need to be in medical school. I need to get to med school. This is, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, and so then, 
as you go through university, you kind of tailor your courses. Uh, so I had anatomy and pathophysiology and biochemistry and kind of those, some of these courses that I didn't enjoy, but again, you need to take them to be able to apply to med school. So, okay, well, this is just something else I have to do to get where I want to get. Um, and, you know, thankfully you find some good friends who are goal oriented as well and supportive and, and you get through it together. And so, um, it was a lot of hard work, um, but again, it felt like I was in the right kind of program that aligned with what I like and where I want to get. Um, so I did four years there um, and then I went into medical school. That's great. I love it. Although I I've, I've have had my fair share of college attempts, uh, a classroom was never for me so I, I really admire people that can really stick through it and I'm, I'm very much a hands-on learn as I go and adapt along the way I think you know as Inuit often do uh, but to be able to to do that and stick with it like uh, kudos to you and it's something that I, I think that we are seeing more and more of uh, especially for Inuit but it's still something that I don't know if behind is, is the right term, but because of the such restriction in post-secondary opportunities in the North, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to uh, be where you are, I think is something that is super amazing. So you had talked a little bit about in the beginning, being attracted to the neurological aspect mm -hmm. of uh, the human body. So you are working, how does it work? You are working towards becoming a cardiac surgeon or you are there? Um, good question. So I've completed um, what's called residency. So after you graduate medical school uh, to become any type of doctor, you then um, go into a residency program. And I, the way I explain that to you know a lot of patients or a lot of people is uh, it's like an apprenticeship. So to become a heart surgeon in Canada, it's six years of training. And each year that you go through it, like an apprentice, you're given you know, more responsibility and tougher jobs type thing until you've kind of done everything in the field. And so I just completed that last month. Um, I was supposed to have written my Canadian like board exams, um, but because of COVID, that's all delayed. So I, I have some hesitancy in saying I'm a real cardiac surgeon because I think it'll only feel real once I get that, that piece of paper from that exam. But uh, I've completed the residency training. So uh, I've been signed off by my program that yes, you know, you're a cardiac surgeon. So, um, so I guess I would say I am. I'm just now here in the US um, to do what we would call like subspecialty training. So, um, you know, I still do all types of different heart surgeries, but I'm here to spend a lot more time learning a particular type of surgery. Cool. I love learning new things. So why, why the heart? What, can you uh, walk us through and talk a little bit about that uh, evolution, if you will, I guess, of going from the brain to the heart? Yeah. So um, started med school and um, a few weeks in or a couple months in, uh, you know, I get uh, involved in something called like the surgery interest group. Uh, so that's for students who are interested in surgery. And um, the the class above us had circulated to us a list of surgeons that were uh, really good about having med medical students in their OR who were really good at teaching or, you know, having them shadow them and type thing. And, um, and so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll contact, you know, a neurosurgeon and see if I can go watch him or her operate. And so I think there was only one neurosurgeon. I'm not, I can't remember. But anyways, I emailed this neurosurgeon and I never heard back from him. Because I was like, hey, I'm a new med student. I'd love to come watch you operate. I'm really interested in becoming a neurosurgeon. Like, I think I'd like this. No response. So that kind of turned me off a bit. Um, and, but, you know, I went to go shadow other types of surgery. Uh, and then it came to our heart and lung course. And I just absolutely loved the heart. Like, I don't know, I loved the, the physiology. I loved learning about it. Um, and then hearing the cardiac surgeon come speak with us and explain the surgeries, like, okay, this sounds really cool. Like, I, I wanna go watch these surgeries and see if I like it. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I watched some surgeries. In retrospect, I realized I really did not understand most of what was going on, but I just felt like, okay, this is so cool. Like, I, I need to do this. I need to see more of this. Like, 
I think this will be right for me. Um, and so, yeah, I did a lot of electives in, in cardiac surgery. And I mean, it just felt right. I felt really excited, interested. Um, you know, the crazy hours, the very long surgeries was, were appealing. Um, the people too, like the actual surgeons, you, you kind of realize in medicine and probably in all types of life, like in a certain specialty, you know, there's very common personalities that you'll encounter. And I just felt like, you know, I fit in with these types of people. Like I, I feel like I get on with them really well. And these are people I could work with every day, day in, day out. Um, so it just felt like a good fit. Um, and uh, yeah, it just, it just felt right. And, you know, I never pursued neurosurgery after that. I, and I hate to say, but a part of it was like, you know, the surgeon can't even be bothered to respond. Like, okay. And then, you know, learning about neurology um, and the actual neurosurgery, it just didn't feel like a right fit for me uh, and for what I would look for as a surgeon. So I think it all worked out the way it's supposed to be. That's something I've come to realize. If it doesn't work out in a point in time, it will in some way, shape or form down down some road somewhere yes. at some point. Um, in, in the time since high school and all the time that you have spent in education, all the time that you have spent doing surgeries, are there any particular experiences that really kind of stick out to you, whether it was a particular surgery or maybe you met someone you never expected to meet? Is there any, um, what, can you give, share some positive experiences of things you're like, I often sit back and I'm like, wow, this is my life. Like, what, <laughs> what's happening sometimes? Like the first time I met Jugmeet Singh, I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, the first time he called, I was like, wow, this is real. Um, any of those kind of like, oh my gosh, this is my life moments? Like a lot, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, like even just this interview, like this discussion is one of them where it's like, oh my God, an MP wants to speak with me? Like, really? Like, um, yeah. So, I mean, a, a, a lot of those moments happen outside of the OR. And I think in the last, you know, two, three years um, with a lot of kind of interviews or, or media campaigns that I've done um, or like, I've been recognized in airports and I'm like, whoa, okay, like, who cares <laughs> that it's me? But like, so there's a lot of those pinch me moments or, you know, if I get invited to speak somewhere, um, whether it be big or small, it's like, really? Like, people want to hear from me? Um, you know, a um, <sighs> couple things. Uh, this sounds like bragging, though. That's why I hate talking about it. But like, so I'll talk about things outside of the R and then things like in the R where it's like, holy crap, like, this is my job. Like, this is what I do. But I mean, I think it was <sighs> a couple years ago uh, for International Women's Day, um, uh, a, a, um, a journalist at, I think, the Globe and Mail um, it contacted me for some information. She said, okay, yeah, here you are, whatever. Didn't think about it. And then she emails me on International Women's Day. She's like, here's the article I wrote. Like, have a look. And it's, you know, top 20 reasons why to celebrate International Women's Day this year. And I was number two. I was like, holy crap. Like, with all these amazing women from all over the world. Um, and even, um, I think it was that same year, I spoke at an event in Ottawa about International Women's Day. Uh, on a panel and we're kind of talking about our experiences and it was I think to be a little motivational and you know because um, I'm a woman in a, a male dominated field and um, afterwards you know you take some questions and a mother like a, a couple not so a, 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 a white mother you know non-indigenous just someone I've never met before um, raises her hand she goes I don't have a question but um, I just want to tell you my 12 year old daughter um, had a school project where they had to write about a role model and she chose you and wrote about you and wants to be like you when she grows up. And like, my mind was blown. I was like, ha, 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 who? <laughs> um, I mean, so those are some pretty amazing moments um, that I've had outside of the OR. Uh, and last year, like I filmed like a, a little project for American Express and Globe and Mail and, um, that, you know, just this amazing video that they put together. And I don't know if it was actually a commercial, but it looks like a commercial and they included me and other women. Like, it's like, this is so crazy. Like, so very, very cool. And then, I mean, every day, like, I mean, it's not every day that I have pinch moments because there's some days where I'm just exhausted and trained and I'm like, okay, get me home. 
Um, but I mean, yeah, when I get to stop and think about like, you know, when I did my first, you know, triple bypass surgery or my first aortic valve replacement or my first mitral valve repair, or, uh, you know, a lot of the times that I did my first stuff or when I, you know, did something in a really efficient amount of time and really, really well, or really smoothly, like, where I feel like, holy crap, okay, like, this is just so cool that I'm actually where I want it, want it to be all this time. Um, and that, you know, people, total strangers trust me with their lives and that I get to train to do this. Um, and, and I, yeah, I've had patients recognize me from stuff in media and I mean, that's been really nice. And, um, I even had a father who said, I'm, you know, I, I showed my daughter one year, you know, your interview, one of them the interview and said, you know, you, you should study, you know, she, she, you know, well, I don't know if that, he said it as badly as that, but like, you know, look at her, like lots of hard work, like you can, you know, be anything you want to be too. And like, I mean, that's just so amazing to feel it's like uh, it's very hard to describe it's it's very surreal um but i just i feel so fortunate to be able to do what i love and that you know it hopefully brings positivity or inspiration or motivation or something for someone out there um it's really really bizarre but, but very cool that's amazing i love it when when you mentioned uh uh, the daughter or uh, someone's daughter doing the role model project on you. I was trying not to tear up over here. It's it's so heartwarming when youth, you know, you're you're doing okay when youth look up to you and they say, "I want to be like like that." Yeah, it's yeah. so powerful on for for a multitude of reasons on on so many different levels. It is so ah, oh, I, I love it. I I love working with youth. Um. You had mentioned being in a male dominated profession and I can 100% relate. I got to sit in the house yeah. of commons with a bunch of older white men uh, and being one of 10 individuals claimed to be indigenous. And uh, it's, it's a very white male space uh, in, in my profession, at least uh, I could one, I could go on and on and on about the challenges, the barriers, the unnecessary challenges and barriers. Mm -hmm. Can you touch a little bit on what that looks like in in your field, in your profession, and how can we look at making more room for women in in different yeah, positions? I mean, this is a great question that I've been asked, you know, by a few different people, um, and I don't know if I have a good answer. I mean, it, it's so, it's great that, you know, um, medical students or undergrad students, especially like predominantly women will reach out to me on social media and, you know, say that, oh, I'm interested in surgery or this or that, or, but, um, you know, and, and watching your, you speak or whatever, you know, makes me feel motivated that I can do it too. Um, but a lot of those messages are saying, well, I felt like I couldn't do it, or I felt like um, I can't be a mom and a surgeon, or I can't have, you know, a great family and a busy practice, or a lot of these things that seem to be perpetuated by people in medicine to the up and coming doctors, just telling this bogus advice and crappy information. Um, so it's super disheartening to hear that. And it's like, well, you know, as like a system as a whole and our culture and medicine has to shift because like, I, at least I felt like these horror stories of, you know, you're not going to be able to have a life or have babies or, you know, do other things that you want because you're a woman. Like, I, I, I don't feel like that that's true. I mean, I don't have children yet. I don't have a family of my own yet, but I do feel like that's going to be a possibility if and or when it happens. Um, I feel like at least where I've been, I've been well supported again. I maybe I'm lucky that I mean I've been in good places, or maybe it truly is just a real representation of things and that it's not as bad as people made it out to be, or I'm not sure, but I you know, it's still happening where I'm getting people telling me, Oh, well, you know, I'm here I'm hearing this and that. So obviously someone somewhere or people somewhere are perpetuating this 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 ideology that you know surgery is terrible for women and so i i think some people do get scared out of it because of that and 
I try to do my best to reassure them and point out other women that I know in the in different fields to get in touch with. Um, you know, uh, the hours are difficult, like, but I mean, that's a lot of practices in, in, in medicine. So I don't think you should say, oh, because it's long hours, you know, you can't, it's tough for women. I don't think so. I think for me, I, a tough part um, was feeling confident, or a couple tough parts was feeling confident in the operating room and kind of that transition stage from being a junior resident to taking on, to being a senior resident and trying to really take on more of like a leadership role uh, in the OR and kind of managing people. And that was difficult because my style of leading and communicating is quite different or was, or I think still is, than from my male colleagues. Um, you know, I think women, we just have a different way of speaking and maybe not as authoritative as I should, you know, as, as I should have been compared to male colleagues. And so I think there was a struggle and some of my teachers or some of my staff maybe felt I wasn't where I needed to be. I wasn't ready yet. I, I wasn't good enough in a sense because I didn't portray myself the way that they're used to seeing. Before me, they only had one female resident. So I was the second female resident in my program ever. So they're used to maybe training men and in certain, you know, being in certain ways. And so I think that was a struggle to really feel confident in how I presented myself, how I directed a team and communicated. Um, and then as I got comfortable just being more so myself, then I think you kind of let, you know, your skills speak for yourself and staff will see, okay, well, okay, yeah, she's got it. it. It's all right. But that I think could be intimidating for a woman. And the other tricky thing, and I hate to say this, but I, I very much feel that it is true. It can be difficult or at times I've had difficult encounters with female colleagues uh, and, and, you know, people listening to this might clue in very quickly, female nurses. And I actually had a, a surgeon I respect greatly, um, a male surgeon who I think, you know, really looks out for me, say, at the beginning of my training, you know, unfortunately, this is something you're going to have to be aware of as a woman in how, you know, your, what you say and what you do, how that's going to be perceived by other women. Uh, because it's very easy to be labeled as bossy, I don't want to swear, but, you know, <laughs> rhymes with which like you know or um or she has an attitude or you know you i see some of my male colleagues and just like how cocky they might come off as uh an arrogant or like self-confident and if i've shown any signs of that it's labeled oh well she thinks she's better than others and then, like that's that part has been exhausting at times because it's just like i know my male colleagues don't deal with this crap and I know they're not as worried about how they say things or what they're saying or their tone of voice or what have you. And I don't think I'm like a nasty person in the OR, but you know, it's just still always in the back of my mind, even today, you know, every day it's in the back of my mind of what, how I'm saying stuff or what I'm saying. Um, because very easily, I think things are blown out of proportion and gossiped about and, then, you know, in, in the ORs, you very quickly build a reputation for yourself. So um, I think that is tougher for women, for sure. That's a very long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. It, it's really insightful because it's something, I think that there are certain professions, and, and I'm in one of those, where you really don't see or know that work culture unless mm -hmm. you're in it or you know someone in it. Because 100%, mm -hmm. I have been treated like jug meat staff, for sure. And I'm like, no, that's my colleague. That's mm -hmm. not, I'm not his staffer. That's my colleague. And, I, and I'm super, super lucky that, you know, uh, one of the last things, one, one of the last things that really pack-a-punched it for me to decide, yes, okay, I'll run with NDP because I was asked last August was jug meat Singh. He is one of the most humble, genuine people I have ever met and I'm super lucky in that way but it's it's true we can we can put a, a, a man and a woman side by side saying the exact same thing and they're gonna they can be perceived completely different mm -hmm. so it, it's really really interesting that uh, and and it's really insightful thank you for sharing 
I had a question and it totally slipped my mind. That's so, I think I just want to like add an agenda that it's, that it's not, Absolutely. of course, it's not all people, you know, it's not all colleagues or allied healthcare professionals. They were like, God, no, but you know, it can just be one or two people and they can just make your day, you know, harder or your week harder or your night on call harder. And it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> So it's not everyone, but, and I, you know, everyone can probably relate that you can have one or two people that can just take things out of context or, you know, be ready to kind of jump on something that you say. Absolutely. I'm a politician. I see this from ministers <laughs> all the time. It's so, so fun. So fun. Uh, yeah. When, when I, I want to talk about actually going into surgery and, and what that's like, because to me, like, okay, I've seen cut up animals sure i i mm. i'm enoch i grew up in the north uh but the idea to me myself seems squeamish and but also intense also like you said some somebody's trusting you at times with their life so is there any are do you feel like you're kind of naturally calm going in uh is there anything that you do beforehand how do you prep for something like that yeah um so when i was very junior in my first couple of years, I used to get a little, you know, nervous, stressed out before going into the OR and, you know, going a lot over the steps in my head and, okay, make sure you do this. And okay, this, this surgeon likes it this way. Okay. So do it like that. And okay. Like, you know, a lot of that, but I mean, as you do things more and more, you get more comfortable and confident and competent. And so, I mean, nowadays, um, I don't think I really have a ritual. I still quietly to myself, we'll just think about certain critical steps of the operation and make sure I have that down. And of course, you know, every surgeon, or I hope, <laughs> uh, you know, the night before I'm going over the case, uh, you know, meeting the patient, I'm going through all their imaging. I'm thinking about cable, but I'm, gonna, I'm planning out my operation the day before. Uh, and so I have kind of my plan already set and, um, you know, now I don't really have anything that I really do. I just, I, I kind of feel like, okay, you're in the OR. It's, it's, it's time to operate. Like this is your time to work. And this might sound really corny, but I mean, so we grew up as a big sports family, um, playing a lot of basketball, baseball, uh, watching a lot of sports. And so as a young kid, like, you know, loved Michael Jordan. And I guess, you know, just a couple months ago, the last dance came out. And so I watched that series and watching this man, you know, and getting to see some of the glimpses behind the scenes, I guess, of his mentality and his attitude and his work ethic and that drive and determination just kind of like reignited that spark in me as like, okay, when I, you know, walk into that OR, like when he walks onto the court, like this is my main focus is like doing my absolute best for this patient. And so I, it's, corny but like I really feel like I, I you know took that to heart and I kind of remind myself that I'm like I am here to work like none of no drama no you know I don't have to be chit-chatting away about stuff like I'm here to work. and so I find I'm reminding people too like okay let's focus like you know like you, like you gotta just be you gotta remember you're here for the patient so I, I don't know like I just it also just feels very comfortable and natural now to be in the OR and I'm just I don't get that anxiety or, or nervousness now like it's just this is my job this and this is my job to do and um i i joke with people like being in the r is like my oasis my sanctuary like i just i get to operate like it's very nice <laughs> i love how you bring up sport Haley wickenheiser is one of my idols oh my gosh she responded to i think i messaged her on Instagram or something and she responded and I thought I was going to fall over. Um, definitely powerhouse woman that I always looked up to. I was super tomboy growing up. Super, super, super tomboy. Like yeah. I'm in a dress. This is an earrings. This is not what I looked like <laughs> 10 years ago at all. Um, but that it's, it's those individuals that show a different kind of drive and mm -hmm. a, a different kind of drive in a sense where that's what it is. Yeah. I think that quite often we don't recognize passion and, and hard work as much as we should be. And I think that we let that pass by in day-to-day -day, day -day life all too often. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it's, it's, it's so powerful, especially when, when you feel that recognition in, 
yeah. what you want to do and, and what you want to achieve. Um, and, and talking about long hours and all the work that's gone into it, what do you, are there any kind of, for lack of better word, weird things that you like doing? Uh, people always ask me that kind of stuff. I'm like, I like Sudoku. I like coloring. I like beading. I like normal people stuff. Yeah. But I don't think people expect me to be like, my coloring and my Sudoku is right here. <laughs> I have it on me. Uh, so is there anything that you, uh, any kind of, I guess, uh, little things that you like to do that normal, normal, I think this is what I'm getting at. We, in our professions, myself as a member of parliament, you as a cardiac surgeon, oftentimes people think that we have some, I don't know how to say this, we have some I like you know when you're growing up as a kid and you see your teacher outside of school and yeah you're like wow they have a life what on earth is going on so that's what I'm leaning towards what kinds of things do you like to do that are outside of medicine outside of surgery oh boy so um I mean these last few years I have not had much free time at all so um I don't do a lot extra I mean uh, one thing is a year ago uh my my partner my boyfriend and i adopted a dog uh and so like he has it's totally become my life and uh you know every spare minute is walking him or going to the dog park um i've had to leave him up in canada as i'm down here for work but uh so that's been a bit different a bit tough but um this is gonna sound just like so stereotypical as a girly girl because i was a big tomboy growing up too like massive times like I wore my hair in a ponytail every day and never styled it like um but I'm very the girly thing about me is um like like a lot of them like I love clothes and shoes and so like um like, uh so I you know shopping and like look, looking at fashion magazines and and following couture designers on social media and seeing what you know their their new collection is like that's that's kind of my thing and so um you know, we had a bit of a delay between cases. And so I was going through with social media and thought, Ooh, I like that dress. And so I bought the dress. Like I did some online shopping uh, and people, please don't judge me for that. Like, it's not like the patient is in the room or on the table. This is, we're waiting for things, you know, we don't even have a patient yet. Like, yeah. So, um, that'd be my kind of thing outside of the OR is, uh, fashion. Which you could not tell right now by my scrubs, but that's fine. Oh, that's what the image I just had in my head. Like you going from <laughs> scrubs in a, a surgery, surgery room to in a couture dress outside of work. That <laughs> was the image that, that went through my head. Um, and, <laughs> oh, that's too good. Um, what about um, when you had mentioned that you were you are currently in the states how long have you been there now um i got here like literally like 30 days ago oh wow so just barely a month you've been there mm -hmm. um are there any um i don't know are there any noticeable differences like does it did it take a little bit of a adjustment and were like to me i would and and this is because I'm a politician, so I'm I'm keeping up with things that are going on. To me, it would be like, oh my God, I'm in this country, and this president is here, and what is going on? That would be my personal having to adjust to. Um, were there any things in particular that uh, you you felt that you needed to, uh, to take a little bit of time to get into the swing of things? Um, oh yeah. So I mean, a lot of that focuses around work. Um, you know. I've, I've operated in Ottawa for six years with the same group of surgeons and I've learned how to do certain things in operation certain ways and I'm very comfortable with that that way and how you know our setup is and kind of our routine and so to get to a new center where a lot of that is very different just in the skin incisions that you make and how you hook the patient up to the heart and lung machine like little easy things that I learned to do when I was very junior it's all a bit different and so it kind of messes with you a bit because you're like okay I need to do it this way now because this is how they do it but it's it feels so unnatural and it's very simple things but it's like crap do I even know how to be a surgeon because this all feels so bizarre and like 
even the instruments that they use for things is different. The sutures that they use for things is different. Um, so a lot of learning of just the differences and in, in how they do their surgeries. Um, too, I mean, in American um, units for, you know, a lot of the lab tests that we get back, I'm like, I don't know what this means. Like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, is this normal? Is this not? Is this high? Is this bad? Is this low? Like, um, so, so the, 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 uh, units, cause they're not using the metric system or, or the, the SI unit that we use in Canada. So that's been an adjustment. Um, but yes, living in the U S I mean, uh, I, I, I visited the U S many times, um, at, you know, as a child, as an adult, uh, my, my partner used to live in North Carolina, uh, when I was a resident, I'd be there every month visiting. So I've come many, many times, but now living here it feels different and it, it, it's hard to de describe well what feels different but the american culture feels different for sure compared to canadian culture and that's kind of stating the obvious and i'm sure people are, well yeah obviously but i never really felt it until being here um americans are different and uh, the cultures are different. And, i mean it is weird it's an election year here in the states i mean look at kind of what's going on in Portland or, or uh, you know the west coast uh now the president's saying that he's going to be sending troops you know I think military personnel to other major cities I think Cleveland is included I mean this is just very bizarre like this is nothing like we have back at home um I I don't think about it a lot just because my hours are very very long at work and it's pretty intense uh <laughs> as I'm a bit sheltered that way but that's a very uncomfortable feeling. Uh, the response to COVID is very bizarre. It's very politicized to wear a mask or not, which I, as a Canadian, it's hard to understand why it's such a big deal. Like, I feel like in Canada, it's like, this is what public health says. The vast majority is like, okay, yeah, this is what we got to do. Like, all right, this is a good thing to help each other out. That's not really the impression I get here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and then just the difficulties of, of moving to a new country. Like, you know, getting a bank account, getting a social security number, which Americans need for everything. Like I didn't, I don't use my SIN for anything in Canada really besides my job. So that, that's very bizarre. Um, you know, being able to get a credit card is very difficult. Like uh, all those kind of weird things that they do differently here that just don't make sense to me, but it's okay. It's coming together. That's interesting and, and I just uh, realized what we hear all the time and what we are seeing constantly on the news, what reporters are talking about, what TV hosts are talking about, we are surrounded and have been surrounded by COVID. And that's the one thing we haven't really touched on yet. Uh, before, you said you've been in the States for about a month now, before that, what what kinds of things changed and what kinds of things how do I say this? What kinds of things really changed within work and really impacted work? Like um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a kidney infection or what we thought was a kidney infection. And I was in so much pain and I was like, well, it's time to go to the hospital. And I was worried about it. And I went there and I didn't have to wait as long as I thought. There weren't as many people there. I was seen pretty quickly. Uh, it's not something I think though that would have happened outside of COVID. So mm -hmm. can you talk to a, a little bit about your experience first in Canada and then maybe in the States and in, in, well, I guess it would be harder to talk to the States because you went in there co like uh, during COVID, uh, right. but maybe in Canada, the that, cha that switch from um, before COVID and then having to take all those precautionary measures yeah um i mean so like cardiac surgery we're so subspecialized um and in ottawa you know we have our own heart institute so we're kind of a little unique that way and so i'm a little sheltered or i think from a lot of things um you know in the cardiac operating room and uh, my experience is you know very different compared to an intensive care doctor's experience or an eMERGE doc um but kind of what we saw is it was mandated, I think, across the province that we had to decrease our number of elective cases uh, so that, you know, we had resources if a whole bunch of COVID patients came in. So that was kind of the biggest thing that we noticed is uh, we weren't doing as many surgeries. But I was at the Children's Hospital during that time. And um, you can imagine for babies with 
major heart defects, you can't just cancel their surgery, uh, you know, like because they, they won't be able to grow, they won't be able to live. And so we actually were still operating as per normal on, on babies and young kids. But I think that was the biggest thing for us. And then, um, of course, if, if someone uh, has COVID, they're already on the breathing machine, but they, their lungs are still failing or they're, you know, still dying. Um, the last resort is to put them on um, a form of a heart lung machine. Um, we hook them up with these big plastic tubes we put into their veins and their neck and their legs, and it takes over the function for their lungs. Um, it's something called ECMO. Uh, and we are the only surgeons in the city, actually, in that in a large area of eastern Ontario and, and western Quebec that can do that, that can do that operation uh, and manage those patients. And so, you know, very um, selective patients were chosen, um, uh, you know, to be able to be a, a candidate if they unfortunately had COVID and, and were dying from it. But uh, we are the guys that, that are kind of your last resort to manage you. Uh, and so that's the same here in Cleveland for patients who, um, are not doing well from COVID, if they need to go on this special type of machine, we'll do that. Um, but I think that those are kind of the major differences I saw. And then, of course, you know, everyone's wearing masks in the hospital, and uh, which we didn't do, you know, for uh, patients on the floor post-op type thing. But that's about it, I think. Super, super interesting. In terms of medicine in itself, is there anything that you hope within our lifetime that we can see uh, whether it's directly related to you and your work or or not what about both sorry let's what would you like to see in medicine and what would you like to do with with your future um in medicine um but like health equity for sure is what i would absolutely love to see in my lifetime for all canadians but i say that especially thinking of Indigenous and especially thinking of Inuit in Canada, ensuring that we have all the same sort of health care and good access to good health care. That is a must, uh, and I really hope that happens in my lifetime. Um, in terms of kind of my field, I mean, hard to say for surgery specifically, but I kind of think again in terms of kind of like health equity um ensuring that we we as uh cardiac surgeons and cardiologists improve the outcomes for women with heart disease women with heart disease like we're understudied we're under uh funded uh we're underdiagnosed we're undertreated um you know our outcomes for women with heart attacks women post cardiac surgery are not as good compared to men um, and that you know that needs to be improved that um, is something I would love to see improved is that our outcomes for women are better um, and that there's more awareness around women too about heart disease and you know getting appropriate medical attention because um, that's a problem we see too that women you know are getting diagnosed later in their disease um, because you know they're put in office something that it's something else or that their responsibilities to their family are too big and they say well i, I you know i can't uh you know get sick or i can't be sick i can't go through something like this because my family needs me so uh, that's something else that i would love to see change i'm learning so many new things that's so exciting uh <laughs> before we get wrapped up for anyone interested in medicine what what would you what would your encouraging words to people interested in this field? Um, if you are interested in medicine, like truly feel passionate about it, excited about it, like wanting to help people, um, then pursue that goal. You know, at times it may feel like a lot of hoops to jump through or a lot of, you know, courses that to take that you might not really like taking um, or, you know, applications to do, exams to do, um, you know, but if you feel like it's your calling, then please go after it. Even if, you know, you feel as a woman, oh, I don't know if like I could be a surgeon or, you know, I don't know anyone else who's done this. I didn't know anybody in medicine. I didn't know anyone, let alone that was a neurosurgeon or, or a heart surgeon. 
and an indigenous and a woman. And I just didn't even care. I just felt like, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, because you know, I feel like I need to do this and, and I worked damn hard for it and I deserve it. And so, you know, work hard, stay humble, keep at it, um, surround yourself with the right people. Um, and if you, you know, really love it, your path and, you know, really want to be here, it can happen and, and your path will take you down a certain way. It might not be, you know, straight from high school to university to med school to residency, and that's okay. There's no one right way to become a doctor or to get into medicine. Um, you know, the path you take is, is meant for you and to teach you things and make you a better doctor. So I hope that's helpful to, to someone. It's incredible. I really, really appreciated your time. Thank you so much for being here with me today. And I'm so excited for your future. And I hope that everybody, uh, follows along and uh people i'm i'm sure there are multiple people that will be sparked with with hope and with passion because of what people like you and i do and uh <laughs> so so great to have you here thank you donna oh thank you so much such a pleasure to chat with you and like i too could keep talking forever but um yeah i think that's enough for me for now <laughs> great uh Yes, thank you so much for, be, for being here with us. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much.